But that man helped provide what I think is the most important ingredient one can bring to this job and this business, one that Red Smith and others had in droves. Perspective. Perspective. Few stories are as awesome as our world makes them in the hot moment of the spotlight. Few things are as good or as bad as any headline may suggest. The smartest fable I ever heard concerned a king who came to a jeweler and demanded a magic ring that would always cheer him up when he was sad and would always keep him humble when he was celebrating. Make the ring, king, the king said, and I'll give you a treasure. Fail, and I'll kill you. The ringmaker only had three days. He searched through all his most precious jewels, but nothing was magical enough. Finally, the deadline came. The king returned, and the jeweler handed him a simple ring with not a single jewel in it, just a simple inscription. This too shall pass. I've never stopped using that sentence or believing it. So if it's custom with honors like this to close one's remarks with what advice you'd give a young person coming up in that business today, I would start there. This too shall pass. And then I would add the following Bs. Be curious. Be skeptical. Be careful. Be right, be ruthless with yourself, but compassionate with those you cover. Be scared of praise, be brave about criticism. Be aware that a microphone is a funny thing, it changes people. Be sensitive that on the record is a guideline, not a trap. Be mindful that a pen is a powerful thing, and a pen plus the internet can change a person's life forever. The image from the movie Absence of Malice, where a woman runs from lawn to lawn, trying to pick up the newspapers before a damaging story can be read, should play in all our heads before we take somebody down. Be a judge, but don't be God. Be fast, but not rushed. Be humble enough to admit a mistake, and I've made plenty, and be able to sleep at night with what you've written. Be in love with language, be respectful of its power. Be in awe of its possibilities. Be prepared. Read everything. Study other writers. Remember that as the saying goes, a writer's brain is like a magician's hat. If you want to pull something out of it, you have to put something into it first. Be proud of the sports section. It's as real as any section of the paper, and it's the most read, no matter what the geeks from Metro tell you. <laughs> Be aware of your community. Be proud of it, because you're a voice of it and for it. I'm constantly asked, why do you stay in Detroit? Why don't you go elsewhere? I always say, why? Is the news more real elsewhere? Be grateful for your seat in the press box. Be funny now and then. Be on time. That's for my editor. <laughs> and always, always be mindful of who you are serving. Not your ego, but your reader. <laughs> I never spent that much time in media hospitality suites because I saw early on the trap of trying to compare notes, trying to impress colleagues with who could write more viciously. I saw how quickly conversations degenerated into bitching sessions, and I felt that bitching just makes you cynical. And where I lived, cynicism was the wrong approach. The readers of Detroit, the guys on the assembly lines, the grandfathers up in Alpena, they wished every day that they could trade places with me. If I turned to a cynic, how would that serve them? So I often kept the distance. I spent more time at events than in the office, more time in my community than in press boxes or media parties. And this may have cost me over the years. People who don't know you are often the quickest to speak about you, especially if you're blessed with some success. But that's been a good lesson, too. And in the end, that to me is what this whole thing's been about. I've learned a lot of lessons, and hopefully passed on a few. I've been blessed with a great boss, and if you could clone Gene Myers, I'd give one to every young sports writer out there. I also have a history of great bosses before him, including Dave Robinson, Joe Distelheim, and Fred Turner of the Fort Lauderdale Sunset. Fred actually called me in Finland in 1983 
after I had applied for a Sunday magazine writer's job through a blind ad in the editor and publisher. Fred somehow tracked me down in a Finnish hotel room and said over the phone in his New England accent, Hey, you know that magazine writer's job you applied for? Yeah, I said. You didn't get it. <laughs> You're calling me all the way over here to tell me I didn't get a job? Well, the guy who was picking that job uh, noticed your sports clips, and he walked them over to me, and I read them, and they're not bad. If you want a job writing sports, uh, I might have one for you. So there's the truth of who you're giving this award to. I was plucked from a pile. I was walked across a floor, and I was dumped on another guy's desk. <laughs> My journey began in the hands of those before me, and this award is my humbly carrying Red Smith's legacy until the next person takes it from my hands and continues the tradition. It is a fine, noble tradition. Let us always remember that about our field. As a writer once noted, there have been great societies that didn't use the wheel, but there has never been a great society that didn't tell stories. And so my deepest appreciation for this overly generous honor. My oldest and best friend in the world, a guy I knew since I was two years old, toasted me once by saying that when we were kids, his father told him there were three things he was absolutely certain of in his life. One, Nixon was innocent. Two, there's no future in computers. And three, that album kid is never going to amount to anything. Thank you for at least a moment for proving him wrong. Thank you very, very much.